Hi, everybody. Welcome to our special technology webinar series. My name is CJ Guo. I'm a program director with the Office of Corporate Relations at MIT. Our office has a great industrial liaison program and the vibrant startup exchange platform through which we connect many of the world's most innovation-centric companies to MIT's leading edge research, technology, and innovation ecosystem, helping corporations to harness the tremendous unique resources that MIT has to offer. Now in this very challenged time, as we are all negatively impacted by the global virus pandemic, we are intensifying our forward-looking engagement with the industry and the outside world at large in science and technology development, innovation and problem solving. So today, we're very happy to have Professor Sili Deng to lead us on a discussion on combustion science and technologies. And combustion may sound very traditional, but if you look at the uh, energy systems we have today, particularly uh, power generation, transportation, combustion is so essential and dominant. So any improvement in efficiency, in emission reduction, will go a long way on the road to a low carbon energy future. Now, Dr. Deng is the Dropoff Korea Development Assistant Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. She received her bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University, PhD from Princeton, and did her postdoc research at Stanford before she joined MIT a couple of years ago. Today, she is leading the energy and nanotechnology group with very active and leading edge research in combustion science and materials. So I look forward to a very active engagement with her. And I invite you to join the discussion by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So we'll try to answer as many questions as you have after Silly's uh, presentation. So with that, please welcome Professor Silly Den. Silly, take it over. Great, thank you for the introduction, CJ. It's real my pleasure to speak to a uh, broad audience about my research. I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, like, uh, uh, so good morning, good e afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending where you are in the world. And uh, this is uh, Silly Deng speaking from uh, MIT uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, it's real my pleasure to speak to you about enabling combustion uh, and energy conversion and materials synthesis with fundamental combustion research. So like what CJ mentioned, that combustion historically has played a very important role in you can say the civilization and the industrialization of humankind. A funny story is that in 200 million years ago, our ancestor, uh, the homos, actually was the first to adopt flames or combustion to cook food. And ever since, you can say that the civilization of mankind actually depends heavily on the development of combustion research and technologies. And in our daily life, we actually see the influence of combustion as a major and dominant combustion conversion technology in the electricity generation, power generation, and transportation, as well as home heating, etc. So is, there's no argue that it has improved or um, contribute a lot to the development of human lives. However, 
how important is combustion nowadays and what kind of role the combustion can play as we transition to renewable fuels and a cleaner energy conversion technology era? Or can combustion contribute in other areas where uh, it can replace or enhance the current technologies? So in today's presentation, I'm gonna share some of my thoughts on these issues. And hopefully you can join me in further discussions. Considering the, broad, uh, the nature of the broad audience, I might skip some of the technical details. Instead, I'll be giving you some broad uh, technology ideas and why the fundamental combustion research can contribute to the development of such technologies. First, let's take a look at the statistical review of world energy given by the BP company. Actually, this review is pretty uh, recent. It documented uh, uh, the energy consumption, world energy consumption dated back to 25 years ago till last year, as you can see from the axis uh, of, the, of this uh, left figure. And I highlighted these three, which are the oil, natural gas, and coal, which are considered as the traditional fuels or fossil fuels. It's very interesting that you can see, although we are emphasizing on clean energy conversion and et cetera, we are trying to mitigate the uh, CO2 reduction by uh, reducing these activities, we can still see an increasing trend of the globe uh, consumption given by the traditional fuels. And the rest three, starting from the bottom, is the nuclear energy and hydroelectricity, as well as renewables. You can see, starting from 25 years ago till recent, there is not much change in the development of nuclear energy and electric, uh, hydroelectricity. Although there are some development in the renewable energy sectors, such development is far from enough. So one conclusion you can get from this left figure, as well as seeing the shares of global primary energy by percentage, is that these three are the uh, traditional fuels. You can see that more than 85% of global energy consumption was provided by the traditional combustion of the traditional fuels 25 years ago. And it is 20, more than 25% until recent. And it's probably still be above 25% in the near future at least. That's the fact. So in summary, we can see that the combustion has contributed a lot to the development of our society in mainly the three uh, energy sectors, electricity generation or power, gen and power or transportation, as well as heat generation. However, combustion is also contributing a lot to the world emissions. For example, 80% of the CO2 emission comes from combustion of fossil fuels. And in addition to that, there are many nitro oxide and sulfur oxide generated from the combustion of these fossil fuels, as well as soot, where you can call them particulate matters. So the agreement is that combustion will be, has been and will be an important component in our energy sector. So the question becomes, how can we make these technologies as clean as possible to mitigate some of the emission issues that we're facing today, especially when we are trying to transition to a clean energy uh, era. Therefore, we can develop our roles for future energy conversion. Let's see what's the future. I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts 
in today's presentation to see how combustion can contribute to uh, the future energy conversion paradigm. Of course, like we mentioned, we're motivated heavily that emission has to be taken into consideration. So I would say it is really important to develop high efficiency, low emission combustion technologies and processes such that we can still continuously utilize combustion as the dominant methodology, at least in the near future, while trying to solve some of the emission problems as we transition to renewables in the longer term. This can also be done by using some fuel additives to the traditional fuels to control the soot emission and NOx and SOx as well. While we can develop some new fuels to replace the traditional fossil fuels, such fuels can be carbon neutral. I will mention some of them, the ideas in today's presentation as well. Also, instead of the traditional utilizations in energy conversion, can we utilize combustion as a technology for other fuels, such as material synthesis, as we try to, cons uh, to transition to renewables, we need to bring down the cost to manufacture some of the infrastructures to harvest and storage renewable energies. Combustion, in my understanding, can be a very efficient way for high throughput, low cost manufacturing. In today's presentation, I'm also going to talk about how we can utilize combustion to synthesize materials for energy conversion and storage. To develop such technologies, we first need to understand the nature of combustion. By definition, combustion is a way to transform the energy stored in the chemical bonds of the fuel to thermal energy. So in this example, you can see a Pratt & Whitney aircraft combustor. What we care about is the flame dynamics inside this combustor. For safety concerns, we want to control the combustion in this chamber such that the flame will not go out or the combustion will not extinct while we are navigating several thousand uh, uh, feet up in the air. We also want to control the combustion process to reduce the emissions out of this combustion chamber because up in the air, it's very difficult to install very heavy after treatment systems. So we want to confine the emissions or try to uh, reduce the soot emissions inside this combustion chamber such that it doesn't go out to the environment. To complete these goals, we need to control the physical processes involved with vaporization of the drop, fuel droplets and the mixing between the fuel and oxidizers, as well as understanding and controlling the combustion going on between the fuel and oxidizers. It sounds like an easy job, but in fact, it is a very strong chemistry and transport couplings. And two of the major components in combustion are the chemical kinetics and the flow dynamics. In terms of the chemical kinetics, we are not simply dealing with fuel plus air goes to CO2 and water. Instead, we're talking about hundreds of species and thousands of reactions. And in terms of the flow, it is much more complicated. We're talking about highly turbulent flows where the smallest scale and the largest scale can span more than ten, uh, tens of thousands of orders of magnitude. Oh, sorry, six of orders of magnitude. So the Reynolds number are very high and the mixing is very strong. So it is really important to understand both components as well as understanding the coupling effects between them. So in today's presentation, 
I'm giving also, uh, I'm trying to give you some flavors of combustion research and how we can develop technologies based on this fundamental research. First, I'm going to introduce the low temperature combustion technologies. To motivate this uh, fundamental research, I want to uh, draw your attention to this figure. Many of you might have seen this in the gas station where you try to pump your car. So you might, sometimes you might wonder what these figures represent. Actually, it represents the octane number of the fuel that you're using. And it is a, it is a way to measure how easy it is to auto-ignite the fuel and air mixture. And the auto-ignition means the spontaneous ignition between the fuel and air mixture. In your combustion engines, actually, when and how the ignition happens is pre-designed. So as your piston is compressing the fuel and air mixture, if the undesired auto-ignition of the fuel and air mixture happens before the design timing, it could damage your machine. And a set process, it's called engine knock. And we know from the research that such engine knock is initiated by the so-called low temperature chemistry. So it is very important to understand how it goes such that we can develop technologies to avoid engine knock. On the other hand, scientists think if, that's if the low temperature uh, chemistry is detrimental, sometimes can cause detrimental engine knock, can we develop such some technologies to leverage this and turn something bad to something useful? And the answer to that question is yes. Actually, some low NOx technology can be developed leveraging the low temperature chemistry. I'm going to give you one example. On the bottom right is the regime diagram of uh, the combustion. And this axis is called the local equivalence ratio. It tells you uh, the fuel and air ratio in, uh, compared to the stoichiometric conditions. One means that's the stoichiometric conditions where in, uh, in theory, all the fuel should be consumed and all the oxidizer will be consumed. So below one is the fuel lean, meaning that you do not have, uh, you do not have sufficient fuel or your oxidizer is more than sufficient. And vice versa, you have the fuel rich where you have more fuel than needed to consume all the air. And the, uh, on the horizontal axis is more easy to understand. It's, it says the temperature or peak temperature of the combustion process. And we know uh, the formation of NOx happens uh, at very high temperature. It's very sensitive to the temperature. While the soot emission is sort of sensitive to the temperature, but it's more sensitive to the local equivalence ratio. Wherever the local equivalence ratio is above two, you need to consider the formation of soot. It has a relatively broad range. Our traditional gasoline engines runs, operate at this location where the red dot is. So you can see it's very important. Uh, it, it will generate a lot of NOx. That is why you have a three-way uh, catalytic converter in your uh, vehicles to reduce the NOx emission. For diesel engines, due to the inhomogeneous mix, mixing between the fuel and oxidizer, you do, run, you do run your engine over a wide range of conditions like this, the diesel engine. So it will have problems both from NOx emission and soot emission. However, by looking at this regime diagram, we can see there is a sweet spot where we have relatively high temperature. So we can have relatively or okay uh, combustion efficiency and we can avoid the, the emissions from both ends. And that's the low temperature chemistry we want to utilize. And that's the low NOx technology we want to develop. 
Here is uh, some figures uh, showing the applications. For the traditional diesel combustion, as I showed before, the combustion time and heat release is controlled by the injection of the diesel fuel, as you can see here. The flame is very inhomogeneous. It happens at the contour where you inject uh, the fuel and where the fuel is in contact with hot air. So due to this inhomogeneity, knots will form at high temperature places and soot will form at the places where you have a lot of fuel and not sufficient air. Some low temperature technologies, such as the homogeneous charged compression ignition and its variant PCCI premix combustion, a uh, premix charged compression ignition and reactivity controlled compression ignition diesels can utilize higher EG, uh, EGR, which is also which is the exhaust gas recirculation to reduce the temperature so that it can bring down the emission from NOx and improve the mixing between the fuel and air. As you can see here, it's more the mixing is more homogeneous compared to the pure conventional diesel case. So you can simultaneously bring down the emission from NOx and soot. However, the start of the combustion is controlled by, by the fuel chemistry, meaning that instead of controlling it purely by the injection, which is relatively easy, we need to first understand how the fuel chemistry happens so that we can control it. So there are some challenges understanding the governing chemistry. First, we need to have a well-controlled flow conditions so we can uh, eliminate the uncertainties from the transport. And then we need to be able to develop the low temperature chemistry and the cool flames associated with the low temperature chemistry. To achieve that in our group, we're using the counter flow system, which is, which is uh, ideally a one dimensional and steady problem to understand the uh, uh, physics, to understand the chemistry. And I'm going to skip some of the technical details, which you are more than welcome to ask during the Q&A sessions. But the take home message is by looking at the simple system where we have heated air and cold fuel and form a flat flame in between, we can investigate the flame characteristics in terms of the ignition, extinction, and propagation of such flames to understand the low temperature chemistry. In the demonstration, we are going to use that methyl ether, which is a biodiesel, to investigate the characteristics of the low temperature chemistry. This is what it should look like for a high temperature chemistry flame, where you can see a very bright flame uh, occur in the middle of this flow field. However, for low temperature flames, there's no visible signal to human eyes. So we actually need to develop more advanced technologies to identify the occurrence of the low temperature chemistry. And long story short, I'm going to show you the uh, results we have, is that by manipulating the on and off of the fuel and oxidizer, we can identify there is an indeed some chemical reactivities where it only happens when both fuel and oxidizers are present. So using an oscilloscope, we can capture the, we, it can reflect the chemiluminescence generated by the low temperature chemistry and the cool flame but we want it to have a more precise uh, determination of the cool flames. So here, we did some experiments with uh, the ultraviolet cameras. So we can, for the first time in the academia, seeing the onsite of this cool flame. 
and low temperature chemistry in this inhomogeneous system. And you can see at the same boundary temperature, sometimes you have the flame, sometimes you're not, which is exactly what can be predicted by the computational study. It's called the hysteresis. It shows that the heat release from the low temperature chemistry contribute to the onset of this flame, such that we can confirm the ignition and extinction heteristic behavior and determines the onset of the cool flame. Following our research, there are actually many more studies in the combustion field to characterize this new class of flame to understand its ignition, extinction, propagation, and uh, stability of this type of flame, and how this type of low temperature chemistry can contribute to the flame stabilization in normally high temperature uh, combustion, high pressure combustion conditions. And I would say these fundamental combustion research are the foundation for engine knock removal and low NOx technology development. So we just talk about what are the future, at least one of the possible future research directions to develop high efficiency, low emission combustion technologies. Then we are trying to see in terms of reducing the soot emissions, can we use some bioadditives to reduce that? And what are the caveats we need to have in mind? From the same figure, I want to uh, direct your attention to this part. Is that in most, uh, I'm not sure about the world, but at least in most of the US gas stations, you, you will see there are no more than 10% of ethanol added to the fuels. And so one of the um, reasons is that we want to bring down the emissions from the soot because there are some oxygenated fuel additives in the ethanol so that it can reduce the soot emission by experiments, experimental uh, investigations. However, actually there's no consensus of how the oxygenated fuel additives contribute to the soot reduction. And it's not clear for different groups of oxygenated groups, uh, what's the role of that and how to compare different uh, fuel additives. So we want to understand what's the role of these ox oxygenated groups. And here we're uh, choosing three representative fuels. The N-heptane, which is a representative for the traditional diesel fuel, and N-butanol, which is a representative for bioalcohol, and methylbutanoid, which is a representative for biodiesel. And we chose them due to the relevance to the transportation, and they, they have the same, a similar volatility such that they can be mixed together and inject together. And also due to the availability of kinetic models so that we can compare experiments with uh, computations. Actually understanding the soot chemistry is very, very challenging. You can see this is a, a conceptual diagram of how soot is formed inside the flame during the inhomogeneous mixing and the local uh, fuel rich conditions there will be some fuel breakdown processes and generate some of the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. You can think of, think of this like a lot of benzene rings stacking together and will generate some soot precursors there in the gas phase. And at some point, this gas phase uh, particles will condense and form solid particles. That's the incipient uh, soot particles, and there will be chemical and physical growth, which lead to the growth of the soot particles. And due to the particle dynamics, the collision happens. You will, feel, you, you will get different morphologies of the soot particles. And if the oxidation of such soot particles cannot be completed within the combustion chamber, it will be 
going out of the system and it cannot be and you, you have to have an after treatment to remove them otherwise it's gonna get released to the environment which can be detrimental to the environment and human health this is a very complicated process and for our purpose we want to understand the, the role of oxygenated fuels and on the soot emission so we need to make fair comparisons because we know for the oxygenated fuels, they also have a lower flame temperature, meaning a lower power that the combustion can provide. One scenario we do not want is that we reduce the power and soot emission at the same time. So you can think about this. If we want to travel the same distance, meaning that we need to provide the same power, we want to have the soot re removed or reduced. We do not want to remove the soot at the cost of removing how, how far you can, trans you can transport. So long story short, again, we see the fuel effect is that the biodiesel indeed is less likely to generate soot. However, the bioalcohol is just as sooting as the, uh, as the traditional diesel. So we are interested to see why this is the case. By analyzing the chemistry, the, the conclusion we have is that the pH formation and growth pathways are basically the same, no matter what kind of oxygenated groups you have. So our, so our attention goes to what happens to the upstream chemistry pathways. To summarize here, our finding is that actually it depends on what kind of oxygen groups you have. For example, in the biodiesel, where you do see a significant reduce in the soot emission, actually having this, uh, this CO double bond is actually very important, such that some of the carbon will leave the system in the form of CO and CO2 without contributing to the formation of soot particles. However, for the bioalcohol, actually water is formed. So you are not reducing the soot, that, the, the carbon that can go into the soot. And it's merely reducing the temperature. That is why bioalcohol, in our case, is not reducing the soot emission. So the take home message is that we need to consider seriously when we are developing and adding the fuel additives to the uh, traditional fossil fuels to reduce soot, we need to see the balance between the energy content or the heat, uh, heat generation content in the fuel and the, develop, uh, and the uh, degree that these uh, fuel additives can contribute to the soot reduction. So we were using some, a few additives to re reduce the emissions. Then the question becomes, can we develop some novel fuels to replace or partially replace the combustion of fossil fuels? Here I'm going to give you some insights or some examples. As you can see, this energy content diagram, we are looking at some metals and especially the aluminum, which is uh, widely available on Earth, it actually has twi almost twice higher uh, energy content compared to the liquid gasoline. And it has been widely used in the solid propellants for aviation and solid rockets. So the question becomes, can we utilize aluminum as the carbon neutral fuel? There are some challenges associated with that. The first is the ignition and combustion of aluminum. Actually, it very, very, needs very high uh, combustion energy, or it's very difficult to ignite and sustain the combustion of aluminum. So we are trying to see if there are ways to make uh, ignition and combustion easier and utilize the energy released from aluminum for clean combustion. And the approach, some general approach, first is to utilize nano-sized aluminum. 
However, we know as the size of particle shrinks, the percentage of the surface aluminum oxide becomes larger. As you can see from the diagram, if you reduce the size from 100 nanometers to 20 nanometers, it roughly 20 nanometers, you see almost more than 70% of the mass is dead mass, which means you cannot really use them. Some other methods are coating this with more reactive uh, alloys and coating this with some fluorine coatings to reduce the product, etc. And in our group, we are trying to see if we can engineer the aluminum particles such that we can enhance the ignition and combustion without lowering the composite combi uh, energy density. So we try several things and give you a brief summary here. Is first, we try to investigate how we can engineer the surface between aluminum and oxidizers and try to enhance ignition and combustion uh, behaviors. And the take home messages, we want to bring the oxidizer and fuel as close as possible in addition to the large surface available for the reaction to happen. And this, in, in our current study, we identify that this precipitation uh, method actually give us the best ignition and combustion technology behaviors. Some other method is that we can add some uh, graphene oxide particles to enhance the combustion, ignition and combustion of aluminum. As you can see, you can add almost like only 3% by weight of graphene oxide. Originally, the aluminum cannot be combusted using only the flashlight, but with only 3% of additive, you can see the ignition happens. And this is much more efficient than some other oxide can be added to aluminum. And finally, I'm going to give you a very short discussion on what combustion can do in addition to, combustion, uh, to energy conversion. And the example I want to give you is a material synthesis. Actually, what is material synthesis? A flame made uh, flame synthesis process is actually quite simple. You can just think about it as uh, the soot emission. Instead, you want to control the process, you want to implement some precursors into the flame and form some products, some de desired products. First of all, is, uh, 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 on the market, there are actually three kinds of flame-made commodities. And the carbon black is basically just the soot particles, but in a controlled way. So you can gather them afterwards and use them in tire and ink. And second group is the titanium oxide, which is widely used uh, as white pigment and in some sunscreen products. And uh, for some nano-sized or sub-micro-sized, you can use them for catalysts for many things. And the uh, film silica or silicon oxide is a very useful uh, flow additives to enhance the flow characteristics. And some newly developed technologies are focusing on synthesizing lithium ion cathode materials using the flame synthesis. As we can see, there is a growing market for EVs. However, we are still concerned about the high price. In fact, a third of the cost of an EV comes from the battery pack. So we are thinking, can we utilize the flame synthesis pro, uh, process to generate cathode materials for lithium ion battery. Traditionally, the co-precipitation method is a commercialized method for producing cathode materials. And you can see the system is actually quite complicated. You need to have the solution preparation process, and then the solution actually does, is only the uh, uh, transition metals, it's not the lithium and you, you utilize the solution and generate some, uh, here you will generate some transition metal oxides, right? You need, it's a very complicated process. 
And then during this lithiation process, you mix this transition metal oxide with the lithium oxide carbon. And then you can formulate this uh, lithium ion cathode. Then the inhomogeneity and the phase separation will be a big problem. And also you can see this whole process is very complicated. And the flame or combustion assisted spray pyrolysis process from the figure itself, you can see it's relatively simple. Again, you need to have the solution preparation, but here the lithium salt is added and mixed with other type of salt such that you are mixing them at the liquid phase, which in theory should be much more homogeneous than you mix it in the solid phase. And then during the spray pyrolysis process, it's just one step and it occurs in a, sec a few seconds. You can generate the powder and then you just need to collect these powders and, and then make them into the cathode materials. It's much more easier than the uh, traditional co-precipitation method. So it has the potential to simplify and reduce the cost of the manufacturing process for producing the cathode materials. This summary slides give you uh, some uh, proofs why these flame-made materials uh, have the advantage of the scalability. Because there's no liquid byproducts, it's easy to separate the gas phase with the solid phase. You can just use a bag to enclose, to trap all the, all the solid particles, such that you can really have a high purity product. You do not need to worry about separating the liquid with a solid. And using the flames, it's a really fast process compared to, uh, it's a, in several seconds, compared to the several hours, or even several days of liquid wet chemistry. And you can achieve the unique morphology by changing the combustion environment. And this is a continuous process where you, need, you can avoid the batch process, which will limit the efficiency. The continuous one can just run uh, smoothly, continuously, so that the overall efficiency of the manufacturing should be very high. And some potential impacts in addition to the lithium ion battery example I just showed you in energy storage, the made products can also be utilized for photovoltaics for some other catalyst. So you can see how the combustion technology can contribute to the material synthesis for renewable energy harvesting and electricity storage. And in conclusion, we can see that combustion has played and will continue to play an important role in energy conversion in the near future, if not longer. So to meet both the challenges from energy and climate change, we really need to develop technologies such that we can have high efficiency and low combustion technologies leveraging the traditional fossil fuels and develop either fuel additives or different type of fuels to replace the traditional uh, fossil fuels and achieve carbon neutral combustion. And finally, in addition to uh, the role in energy conversion, we can really use combustion as a way to synthesize materials such that we can bring down the cost to manufacturing uh, materials for energy conversion and storage. And here is an acknowledgement for some of the funding agencies that are supporting my research. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. And feel free to visit my uh, group website at MIT and have any further discussions uh, via the Q&A. With that, I'm going to thank your attention and stop the sharing and turn the microphone to CJ. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sidi. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I saw in the Q&A feedback says this is a fantastic talk. I, I agree with that. Uh, and and uh, we have several very good questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, it's, it's, what's, what, they want to know what's the role of sulfur uh, in combustion relative to, to NOx uh, and other components like silicon. And uh, a follow-up on that is, uh, any, are there any economic analysis 
that, that can show that uh, can you maintain uh, the, the low cost? What is the lowest sulfur level uh, you can maintain low cost without losing the BTU in the process? Yeah, so I guess the question is related to the sulfur. Um, yeah, well, you can try to refine the fuel before the combustion. That, that, is, the, that is one way of uh, treating that, and you will have an, a way to, to uh, do the after-treatment where you need to have some after-treatment systems. And the role of sulfur is that it's not really com contributing to the heat generation per se. We normally will just... Uh, think that is, uh, that is something undesirable. For example, you know, when sulfur byproduct interact with water, it can be very acidic. So it can actually corrode uh, your equipment, etc. So in general, we do not want sulfur. And also you actually need to get rid of it such that in your post or uh, after treatment system, it does not pollute your catalyst for other processes. So I would say it is indeed a trade-off uh, whether you want to remove it ahead of time before it enters combustion or you want to capture it right after. I think in a lot of uh, coal car power plants, this is more a uh, severe issue. And uh, my hometown actually is China. And uh, I, I heard that the sulfur after treatment system is quite mature and uh, it, it can achieve almost 100% of reduction after the combustion. And considering the cost of removing sulfur from the coal or from petroleum, they decided to do it afterwards rather than upstream. As okay. for the technological, I, I think definitely there are analysis for that. I do not have the numbers off the top of my head. And uh, like I said, there, there must be a balance that you need to consider. Okay. Uh, the other question, I think it's a good one, uh, that you mentioned that use of aluminum uh, for combustion, obviously carbon neutral, everything. But what about the uh, economic uh, uh, evaluation of that? Can that be uh, economically competitive with, with the current technology? Yeah, that's definitely a very good idea, a uh, very good question. And also, I want to mention not only the combustion way, People are also looking into using aluminum to generate hydrogen, then combined with the hydrogen technology, fuel cell, et cetera. Um, so utilizing the aluminum as a primary fuel, actually uh, they've used it, uh, people have used it, I think for several uh, decades for the solid propellants, because you know, for those aviation applications, cost is never an issue. That's not the priority. And of course, nowadays we're developing technologies to utilize aluminum for the civil uh, applications. Then definitely cost is an issue, especially uh, although we have a lot of aluminum, refining the aluminum actually costs a lot of electricity, etc. right? Uh, then the cost definitely is an issue. And uh, some other things we can do is that try to utilize some of the scrap uh, aluminum from the construction where you already have a lot of uh, waste aluminum. Uh, that's the one direction one can go. And uh, bring down the cost is definitely important. And given the drive in climate change and in developing uh, carbon neutral fuels, at least that's a, uh, to my understanding, that's a viable way, at least to, to investigate, to start with. And uh, do you think there's a resources constraint if you use uh, aluminum at scale for combustion, which is such a huge uh, you know, industrial scale process? Do, do we have enough of, of the resources? Yeah, I actually do not think aluminum resources it would be any issue. So if you consider the, the most abundant uh, metal in the, on the earth would be aluminum. It's the third uh, element that is abundant on the earth. So we, we do have a lot of aluminum resources on earth and that will actually, and it, you can find it almost everywhere on the earth. So I, I would say uh, aluminum actually is more available to many countries 
compared to other primary fuels, right. such as a, uh, okay. fossil fuels, no, no, where you okay. do have some localized locations can produce okay. that. Now, related to the aluminum combustion, obviously, people are also asking that what about the uh, pure hydrogen combustion, where you just, you know, react with air, produce only water. Uh, I, I guess, I guess the risk and economical problem there. You, you, your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, in terms of the combustion itself, there's no problem. It's uh, yes, you can use uh, hydrogen. And uh, hydrogen is great. And uh, you actually have very high uh, flame. In terms of the characteristics of combustion, you actually have a very high flame speed. Uh, Let's just uh, give you some numbers. For example, the traditional fossil fuels has a flame propagation speed about 40 40 centimeters per second. And uh, pure hydrogen combustion is two meters. So in terms of propagation, the reaction time scale is much, much faster. So you can say uh, hydrogen is more reactive than most uh, hydrocarbons. And uh, uh, so in using it as a fuel, it has no problem. I think the, the problem is how to, re- how to combine hydrogen with the current uh, combustion devices. That would be, be the problem because of the huge difference of the combustion characteristics. For example, originally you have a gas turbine that can run with a gas, with with oil or natural gas. And all of a sudden your flame speed is five times higher. Then you can actually cannot control, control the combustion within this chamber. The flame will go back to your manifold and cause safety issues. And I think due to the, and then you actually need to redesign your system, et cetera. So I think technology-wise, how to incorporate hydrogen with your current strategy and infrastructure is some is the challenge, and how to and also due to the very uh, reactive nature of hydrogen, how to maintain the safety, how to control safety issues is another challenge, and like CJ mentioned, generating hydrogen itself, uh, we need to consider the cost versus the benefit. Uh, currently, most effective way, or at least uh, commercially, it's been used like the uh, fuel reforming from hydrocarbons. So in, in that sense, right, uh, how can you improve the efficiency and uh, how to transport the hydrogen? All of this needs to be considered. And there's another big uh, area that people are exploring is that how, what if we use uh, electrolyzers to use water splitting to generate hydrogen? We're using catalysts for the chemical, uh, chemically or uh, electrochemically to, to have the, the water splitting. Those are the emerging technologies. And of course, what, whenever there's a technology coming up, there are debates regarding the economic issues and technological issues. These are still open questions. Right, right. Yeah, we still have a lot of questions coming up. Uh, it says, what about the output of the combustion of metal compatible additives? Does that mean we have to change our three-way catalyst converter? Uh, so what do you mean by the... By the... Maybe he's saying if, if you add it, metal compatible additives, uh, obviously before you don't have that in, in a car, then the, the three-way catalyst converter will be different when you add more additives, right? Right, so it depends. So if you do not have NOx or SOx, then you do not need to have a catalytic converter, right? Um, mm-hmm. So you can basically you just need to trap all the solid uh, things. And like, like I said, aluminum byproducts is not toxic at all. So it's just the uh, aluminum oxide, we can, we can see it every day. So you basically just need to trap all the particles you have you, you have you have a bag or something like that. You can you can have that, or in other sense, if you have, uh, like I said, people are investigating using aluminum to generate hydrogen. Then maybe someday you can carry just carry the aluminum, which has a very high energy density, and on the fly in your vehicle you can generate hydrogen, and hydrogen runs a fuel cell, and in that way you can both. Uh, take advantage of the high energy density of aluminum 
and also utilize the, the high uh, fuel cell efficiency from the fuel cell chemistry, as well as the, the clean combustion from the uh, hydrogen. That's all possible. But how to develop such a compact technology, of course, uh, that's just something I, I brainstorm about. Um, hopefully, yeah. one day people can investigate that idea. All right. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of our viewers want to know what's the impact on NOx and soot formation when you compare biofuel versus conventional fuels? Right. So the biofuel, uh, I talk a little bit about the, the soot effect of uh, bio additives or biofuels on the soot, is that it's really tricky. As I mentioned, the flame temperature, if you compare like one kilogram or one gallon of biofuel versus one gallon of uh, traditional fuel, the heat content actually goes down. So uh, you really need to consider that when you compare the, the soot emission. Like I said, you do not want, want to bring down both the emission and the energy content. And in terms of the NOx, since you are bringing down the temperature, then it's very likely that you are bringing down the NOx emission. Okay. Still coming up, still question coming up. Is there research on additives to control the flame speed of hydrogen? Yeah, so it's you can you can think about like the vice versa. Is people are actually looking into how hydrogen addition to the traditional fuels influence of flame speed and other type of research. So yes, there are many many ways to do that. And there there for me as a combustion scientist, I think there is a trade off. The first one is there in terms of characterizing its combustion. Uh, the fundamental combustion ones, people use flame speed, emission delay, those very, uh, you can call them scientific work on the lab scale. And uh, it serves as a benchmark so that you do have a starting point that or fair point to compare among different data. However, it's also important to look at how it really behaves in the real applications under the real thermodynamic conditions and in the real engines. Um, so I would say it's a trade-off how to find the benchmark in the industry and in the lab scale. But yes, there are many, many uh, research people are looking into this. Um, the point is that how we can gather all the information together and, and make fair comparisons. That's the challenge. Okay, now our time is basically up, but I'll, I'll just get in one more question, that, that combustion assisted manufacturing, for example, the castle, that's a fascinating idea. So, but what, what stage uh, is that at in terms of uh, being economically deployable? You know, because at the end of the day, you have to produce at a very competitive cost, even though you simplify the process. Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, the, from my recollection, I think in the community of looking at the, the cost reduction using flame synthesis, my recollection is that it can reduce the cost by 10%. So it is uh, economically viable. And in terms of the synthesis, I mean, the assembly line actually is much more simpler compared to the current ones. And of course, when you really put into if you build a new, uh, new plant just for that, I think it's relatively easier compared to replace the current assembly line because, you know, for real application, you need to consider upfront costs as well. If you abandon your current stage to, to adopt a new technology, then people will have some concerns about that. And in terms of technology development, I, I think people are still developing more advanced controlling uh, technologies to, to really control the morphology of the products and the uh, 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 electrochemical performance of the product. I think this is really promising. And I do see there are increasing number of papers and research groups joining this effort. And my group is just among one of them. Okay, thanks, Lee. I, I think uh, we are constrained by time. I think uh, we're about to end this session, but Thank you for the fascinating talk, uh, as, as feedback uh, says, and uh, also thank you everybody uh, 
join for joining us uh, probably from around the world. This is a great session, lots of questions. Uh, if you have further questions, you can always uh, find uh, Sili at uh, MIT's uh, site. You can find me, uh, G-U-O-C-J at MIT.edu. We're always connected. Uh, thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Stay safe and well. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.